Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, as people continue to trickle in, feel free to say hello in the chat. We love to see where everyone's joining us from. Um, share your name, so just say hello, um, and you're, where you're, yeah, you're, you're Zooming us from. Um, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Jared Packard. I'm the exhibitions manager here at the Bema Center, and I'm thrilled to welcome our guest curator, Sylvie Fortin, and three of our amazing exhibiting artists right now, Crystal Campbell, Oliver Hussein, and Kristen Schrodinger. Um, before I hand it off, I'm just gonna give a quick plug for some upcoming events um, because we want you all to come back and remain engaged in some of the amazing artists and things happening here at Bemis. Um, most imminently, this Thursday, we'll be hosting Public Assembly bodily autonomy. This is a program for those who are local. It will not be virtual. So if you're local, please consider coming. Um, our local artists and activists, Denise Chapman and Jamonte Watson will be facilitating this conversation around bodily awareness and uh, autonomy and how we might be inhospitable with our own bodies and how that might reflect on our relationship to others. This should be a great conversation. I hope you'll join. Um, we'll be having a, on February 22nd, a virtual event um, between two other exhibiting artists in our current exhibition, Jenna Sutella and Heather Dewey Hagsborg. Um, and next week we have two outstanding programs. I really hope you'll join, they'll be outstanding. Um, first one being Norman Ajari, um, hosted by our partners at University of Nebraska Omaha. Um, also in person or virtual, please RSVP. I'll drop the link when I'm done chatting so that y'all can get yourself registered. Um, so finally, just shout out and thank you to all of our um, sponsors who make this possible. So thank you and check out um, more ways to engage us online. I'll drop those links here in just a second. So I'll pass it off to Sylvie to take it over. Thank you everyone. Thanks, Jared. Um, I also want to thank uh, Davina Schreier, who's in the background, making sure that this runs smoothly today. And Alfredo Almaraz Herrera, who will be fielding your questions in the chat. Uh, welcome to everyone. And thank you so much for joining us today for the second event in the series of Zoom Artist Talk that accompanied the exhibition, I Don't Know You Like That. We're delighted that you're here and we thank you for choosing to share the next hour with us today. Today's talk will have three parts. Oliver Hussein and Kirsten Schrodinger will present their work and ideas for about 20 minutes. Crystal Z. Campbell will follow, sharing insights into the work on view at Bemis and their broader practice for about 20 minutes. And then we have 15 minutes for you. So uh, get your questions ready. And uh, today's event, we've decided to allow you all to turn your cameras on if you wish. Uh, this way we'll have a better sense of who's in the room and see our friends, which is always nice. Our session is being recorded. Um, so this includes the chat section. And I'm just saying that in case you'd rather um, not be on camera so that you can have the freedom to turn it off. The recording will be published on uh, Bemis's web, uh, Vimeo site as well as the website. Um, as we're speaking today, please share your thoughts, your, your queries and your comments in the chat section, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. And let us know if you'd like to voice your own question or if you'd like us to read it on your behalf. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to welcome Oliver and Kirsten. Oliver is an artist and filmmaker based in Toronto. Oliver's projects often begin with a fragment of history, a rumor, a personal encounter, or a distant memory. He uses a wide range of cinematic languages and visual pleasures, such as dance puppetry, costume, and special effects to animate his research and fold viewers into complex narrative setups. His work has been presented in numerous exhibitions and international festival, and with Shea Heredia, he recently co-edited the eighth edition of Nang, I love that name, um, a magazine focusing on cinema in Asia, and it was dedicated to Loud Mess. Kirsten Schrodinger is a Berlin-based artist working in performance, film and video and sound. Her historiographic practice questions the means of image production, historical linearities and the ideological certainties of representation. 
She researches the coinciding histories of industrialization in film and her work and curatorial practice are often collaborative. You can find more information about Oliver and Kirsten in the chat, either now or a little bit later. And on behalf of everyone in the audience, I'm delighted to welcome Oliver and Kirsten. Please take it away. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvie. And thank you for, uh, for everyone at BMIS. Uh, so we're going to do this uh, little talk together, of course. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, start with telling you a bit about the installation in, in the exhibition. Uh, and then Kerstin is going to tell you a bit more about the context and the research that is uh, uh, the basis for it. And then we're actually going to watch um, the film that we made in that context here on Zoom uh, and then tell you some more how that came about. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start the slides. So this is um, in at BMIS, the kind of entryway uh, looking through uh, Selena Ecesa's work. Uh, that kind of perf it's like, yeah, we were re really thrilled with this um, with this kind of intro uh, or uh, the, the, the connection between the two pieces. Uh, and then you see the screen in the back and it's a it's a um, transparent screen. So the projection can be is visible from both sides. And um, this is the installation itself. So there are th uh, the title of this uh, ex uh, installation is DNCB and it is um, Three channel, a uh, three-channel work. So there's a video uh, which is on that big transparent screen um, that is um, showing a performance. Um, uh, then there's a, a 16 millimeter film. You can see the projector there on the right that is, um, um, yeah, showing a looped five-minute 16 millimeter film, which is. Um, basically an animation that is based on um, the research material that we found. And um, there's a third layer that is much less visible and you only encounter it if you go kind of deep into the space. Um, uh, the, you see the, the subtitles there on that screen that is in front of the, of the other screen. And um, it is uh, uh, audio interviews with um, uh, AIDS activists and um, survivors of you could say of the of the 80s and 90s uh, who um, who talk about their experience with DNCB and so all uh, so Cassian is going to tell you more about that in a minute so all three channels are playing independently they're not like synced in any way so uh, each visitor has a slightly different experience uh, of this work and um, the correspondences uh, yeah, happen kind of randomly. And um, what we're gonna try here today is also do something similar for you here on Zoom uh, in a bit. Yeah, so um, the work is titled uh, DNCB and DNCB stands for Dinitrochlorobenzyl. Um, which is a, a chemical compound um, that is used in color photography and uh, in developing color film, uh, analog film. And um, it was discovered in the 80s um, that uh, using it as a, a medical treatment against Kaposi sarcoma, which is a kind of skin cancer that one can um get when uh, when you're um having hiv um that it creates a uh, reaction on the skin so it's um it was then used um as a sort of um alternative treatment um in a time especially in the early mid 80s um when there was no um regular treatment or no um everything was still quite experimental in terms of treatment against HIV and uh, AIDS. And um, so there was um, people becoming, uh, getting in, involved in um, 
self-organizing their uh, treatment uh, possibilities and DNCB became one um, medical substance that was used in that context. So people began to organize the distribution of the chemical. They ordered it um, at Kodak, for example, or in other photog photographic labs uh, in bulk. So it becomes in like, I don't know, kilo, uh, or what you say in the US. Um, and um, and then you mix the, the substance um, together to apply it on your skin. And it, of course, it's very toxic. So um, if you have a healthy, so, so to say, healthy immune system or working immune system, you have an allergic reaction on your skin. Um, but if your um, immune system is compromised, as it is the case if you have uh, HIV, um, you may not have a reaction immediately. And um, so the substance was actually stimulating the immune system in a sense. Um, so people were experimenting with applying the substance actually on their skin. And um, it, it's a very, in, of course, very intense um, situation. Uh, one can imagine that uh, all the desperate, desperation maybe um, speaking in uh, in that situation where you think you apply something quite toxic onto your skin. Mm. And maybe you show the next image. Yeah, I think uh, the next one would be to go into the... Ah, okay. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, we could. I wanted to say something about... Because um, I kind of came across this... Or we came across this story a little bit by accident. Um, and then began, began to research into this... Um, in, into this kind of uh, moment when this... Um, substance started to uh, change its purpose from being used in chemical photographic labs uh, um, and became this kind of had had uh, became got this kind of um, medical uh, purpose in a sense so um, that was then the, the starting point for the research where we then started to look in different directions Mm -hmm. uh, in different archives in San Francisco, for example, and also in Toronto. Yeah, and our, our so this project has been with us for a while, and we've been uh, researching this for, since together since uh, 2017 already um, uh, in various archives. And the, so the the two. Uh, we want to sh share with you two of the channels that we were talking about earlier. So the the uh, 16 millimeter film and the video will play kind of parallel. And um, uh, so just to uh, so so one of the things that we found out about is that a lot of video artists at the time and uh, artists in general were re very involved in uh, activism and uh, were producing videos that were reacting to uh, the dramatic situation, um, but also were producing videos to distribute knowledge, because quite contrary to this current uh, pandemic that has been, you know, so public and so like on top, on top of the news uh, in every at every moment uh, in the early years of the AIDS, uh, like the the first years uh, of the AIDS epidemic, this this was not the case. So so it was actually uh, silent, right? And that was uh, that was very. Uh, sh yeah, uh, yeah. This this urgency of actually distributing news and distributing treatment treatment opportunities became something that artists also worked worked with, uh, or felt. Uh, so the, so the videos that they produced wa were artworks, but they were at the same time treatment newsletters, and so we looked at a lot uh, of these kind of videos that were produced in uh, Canada, for example, that are collected at VTAPE, an archive here in Toronto. And the um, the performative video that we did was very much based on the aesthetics that we saw in these videos, uh, which were surprisingly non-didactic, always very queer, very joyful, um, and, uh, uh, and often had a very satirical and uh, 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 kind of rough kind of humor, yeah, dark humor. Um, 
uh, so we we were uh, very inspired by that. Mm, so let's watch this and then we'll tell you more about it. Oops. Sound, can sound.
Um, so yeah, so we wanted to show you the f uh, the full length of the 60 millimeter film, and I just randomly stopped the video wherever that happens, so the video continues for another five minutes or so. Um, and uh, uh, like I said earlier, this uh, so uh, both tracks kind of play individually uh, without being really synced, but as you can tell, there's a lot of kind of correspondence that happens. Uh, that we were actually really excited about when we uh, finally put those two together in a space. And uh, the idea of painting on the skin is then repeated kind of with this idea of painting on the film. And this was one of the reasons why this uh, this short, this anecdote about the NCB that we started with was so fascinating for us. The idea that, uh, that there is this uh, correspondence between filmmaking and uh, and medical treatment, right? And the kind of a healing, you could say a healing power of some of the chemistry of uh, of filmmaking. So this was just this idea was, was what uh, started our research. So now we want to tell you a bit more about the, especially the film, uh, so the, on the, on the, on Kerstin's screen, <laughs> the the film that appeared the, there, the 16 millimeter film, and some of the the visual material we used for that, and how uh, we processed that film. So, okay, so I'm going to start the slideshow again. Yeah, as I was saying, um, we we started researching with going into several archives, um, in particular in Toronto, um, and but also in San Francisco, and um, because that was really the what we found out, or as far as we found out, the starting point of this um, guerrilla clinics that started to use DNCB as a as a treatment. Um, and so um, I came when I went to this archive. It's at the University of San Francisco um, in the yeah, in the library, the archives. They had the actually the records of um, of this person here, Jim Hendry, who is um, one of the founders of the um, of this guerrilla clinics. So one of the first people who started using it and. Um, he describes, in, and then there was also his diaries, and he describes in quite great detail um, how this came about, that he, they started to organize themselves around uh, trying DNCB, um, also describing which kind of hopes they, they had into trying things like that, and also um, really explaining um, how he's trying to get more people involved, how he's trying to to activate um, journalists to write about it, to, to get the word out. And I think that was also something that was very interesting for us to find out how information was distributed. Um, so there were these kind of uh, treatment newsletters that were uh, sent around um, by mail, by post. Um, and they collected a lot of information and often um, also information that uh, without um, how to say um evaluating it no so so without saying this is it's just giving out the information that it's there and it's being uh, tried or experimented with but not saying okay this works or this doesn't work and um and that also um created this kind of new um way of how um treatment uh, could actually be accessed or can could actually be um, something that you do yourself or um, can participate yourself much more than in a in a um, classical medical way so then we came across this uh, book which was published in the early 90s um, and that is kind of a collection of essays um, that um, this person Charles Caulfield together with an, another activist, Billy Goldberg, uh, wrote um, uh, about these kind of um, anarchist treatment uh, or anarchist medicine, basically a kind of idea of um, radical um, approach to um, dealing with um, 
treatment be in a time when there was no that was before the mid 90s so there was no working uh, treatment uh, available for anyone so it was really um something where people started to wanted to be uh, self active uh, active themselves or um also trying to maintain a, a certain kind of um self organization around how they how they could live with with hiv um, and um and and the recipe that is uh, animated in our 60 millimeter film is directly f taken from this book and so i think uh the ncb was uh, one of the um was kind of a perfect example for an, for an alternative treatment because it was so easily and cheap available from kodak for example and uh and so it it became more of a symbolic uh substance something that uh people could use to uh, uh if they um did not want to go through the official um treatment not want to take azt which was very expensive and had a lot of dangerous side effects so uh it became this kind of perfect um alternative treatment that was on the radar so you, so to say of the of the medical industry also because it was very cheap so it there was no and you couldn't um uh, what's the word? Uh, it, it didn't ha it couldn't be copyrighted. Yes, exactly. So mm. um, there was no profit to be made from it, basically. Mm. And that kind of fed into this kind of idea that it wasn't researched enough because no one was interested in making no profits, basically. Mm. Um, uh, and so uh so the the activists that we talk about they uh, uh when they um that we talked to that we interviewed when they recollect using uh this substance dncb on their own bodies uh they um most of these stories are a story of frustration they're not they're not saying that this was you know a great solution or something they they all said well who knows if it helped or not we tried everything so for them it was more a uh, a, a memory of desperation actually to use it and so we uh, so we also of course very carefully tried not to you know make kind of a promotional uh, a promotional work about dncb and the use of dncb um because dncb was part of the chemical process we also thought about uh, from the very beginning we were clear that we wanted to work with uh, film material to do to do something on 16 millimeter material and uh, we started to experiment with um, replacing the chemicals with uh, organic um, uh, with organic substances and especially healing substances. So I think when we talked to Sylvie the first time, we were just in the process of um, using turmeric uh, uh, as a healing plant as part of our, uh, to develop the films that we were uh, working on. Um, and so this is of course not our own invention to use organic uh, material it's kind of an international movement right now that uh, it's a very popular um, tool that people are exploring and that is very exciting to to use uh, especially uh, what i put up on um, screen here is a recipe that is using instant coffee and so uh, we also experimented with that and then uh, combine it with different uh, plant material and um, uh, this year in Berlin, when we were actually in the laboratory and uh, work, uh, doing the final version of the 60 millimeter film that you just saw, just by chance, we came across a, a, a story about a healing plant um, in Germany that was uh, kind of the opposite of uh, DNCB. So uh, there was a naturopath here. This is an, a, a newspaper article from a tablet style magazine called Der Spiegel uh, from 1997. It's a very critical article about this uh, doctor. She was a naturopath who was married to a, a high-ranking politician. And so she got a fascinating study started that uh, was looking at St. John's Wort, the, um, the medical plant uh, that is proven as an uh, uh, antidepress antidepressive uh, substance. Uh, um, 
uh, she was looking at that and uh, and got like a huge uh, grant from the government uh, to research the effects of this plant on HIV. And uh, it was um, in the end proven that she was not right. It, there was no uh, big uh, healing effect. But the, the, um, the very uh, sad part about this story is that this research got much more funding than uh, than the AIDS, uh, actual AIDS uh, activists at the time and, and all the kind of um, yeah, more real um, AIDS research happening in Germany at the time. Um, so we, so it was kind of the opposite story of the NCB. So this is kind of a, an alternative uh, that was government supported, and um, so we, uh, so we actually uh, then went to the um, pharmacy and got these. Uh, in in Germany, this Johanneskraut is Saint John's Wort, and that is uh, very available in every pharmacy. So we got these um, pills, and then you made a. Brew, kind of a brew, a thick soup out of those, and that's what we use to develop our film. And that's how you get that kind of uh, very pink tint, that is also kind of different. So if you would go to Bemis right now, the the color of the sixteen actually looks very different. So it uh, kind of varies with every print that we made. Yeah, that. I uh, think um, we were told to wrap up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but maybe we can talk a bit more to towards the questions at the end about what we're doing next and how this yeah. uh, is going on. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. That was amazing. And um, I invite everyone to share your thoughts or questions in the chat. And um, so I'm really honored to introduce Crystal Z. Campbell, who's the 2021-2022 University at Buffalo Center for Diverse, Diversity Innovation Distinguished Visiting Scholar, multidisciplinary multi artist, experimental filmmaker, and writer of Black, Filipinx, and Chinese descents. She's also a 2021 Guggenheim Fellow in Fine Arts, and Campbell finds complexity in public secrets. So you'll see the connection between the speakers on this panel, fragments of information known by many, but undertold or unspoken. Their archive driven work in film and video performance, installation, sound, painting, and text has been exhib exhibited internationally. And they've received numerous awards, including the Paula Krasner Award, MEP Award, Skohegan, Rikes Academy, Whitney ISP, Tulsa Art Fellowship, and the Fla Flaherty Film Seminar. Campbell was a Harvard Radcliffe Film Study Center and David and Roberta Logie Fellow in 2021 and is a founder of the virtual programming platform archiveax.com and it's spelled exactly um, how, how it sounds, archiveax.com. So without further ado, please welcome Crystal. Hi everybody, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we could start the... Um, the PDF file, that would be great. Thank you, Sylvie, for the introduction. And thank you to Bemis for hosting um, this incredibly thoughtful um, exhibition that Sylvie has spent years um, culling and sort of researching and manifesting. Um, so uh, let me see. Can everybody see the, the scrolling um, show here? Okay, I can't see anyone right now, so um, thank you. <laughs> so it looks like I, I will be talking at my screen. Um, in, I'm gonna be brief just in consideration of time, but I wanted to share with you today an essay that I wrote um, as I was working on this project. And the images that you see are from 2012 and 2013. And um, those are all works that I was creating when I was thinking about uh, Henrietta Lacks' narrative, um, which was also the work that I did while I was in residence in the Netherlands at the Rijks Academy. Um, and I think it was important to say that because some of the works required um, the production facilities that they had available and, and the support facilities that they had to actually manifest um, 
And so the essay that I'll read is called Portrait of a Woman, Notes Between Art and Science on Henrietta Lacks. And this was published in 2015, uh, but I believe I finished it in 2014. So you'll hear some references to time. Um, a couple years ago, while I was perusing online wares on eBay, I stumbled across a strange entry, human skin, fingertip. I click the link to buy it now. A week later, I received a rumpled white envelope posted from the United Kingdom. The envelope was unmarked with no return address, should I have buyer's regret. Buried in bubble wrap, I found an unremarkable glass microscope slide with a pink stained fingertip. Holding the fingertip between my thumb and index finger, I wondered who it belonged to, whether it was a consensual or non-consensual donation to scientific research, and what the path was that led to its online and global commodification. I considered the creative research I started in 2012. The work is based on the narrative of an African-American woman Named, Afri named Henrietta Lacks, who died of cervical cancer in 1951. Scientists at Johns Hopkins University took her cells without her or her family's consent, albeit medical consent was not yet an established protocol. While Henrietta Lacks's family had no medical care, her, immor her immortal HeLa cells would become the first commercially produced cell line paving the way for, for biotech industry and enterprise. And perhaps more remarkably, her cells would become the first human material in space. Meanwhile, researchers and scientists used HeLa for numerous ventures, sequencing DNA, developing vaccines for tuberculosis and polio, and marrying her cells with the cells of mice for the first known scientific cross hybrid. Prison prisoners <clears throat> were injected with cancerous HeLa cells to see if they too would develop cancer. My first introduction to Henrietta Lacks's narrative was through the Whitney Independent Study Program. Reading a text about medical ethics, I recall a short paragraph about Henrietta Lacks in passing. I don't remember the article or any other content, only the fact that I read and reread this single paragraph about Lax's enormous and voluntary contribution to modern science. Other scientific ex experiments crossed my mind. Sarchi Bartman, Hottentot Venus, whose body was deemed an anomaly and was literally dissected by a scientist. Display. The Tuskegee experiments in which treatment was withheld from African American men infected deliberately with syphilis in order to be able to observe the disease's natural progression. And numerous pharmaceutical drug trials at home and abroad on persons deliberately exploited and uninformed about the true nature of these experiments. In real life, Henrietta Lacks was not being celebrated. Rather, Helen Lane, a fictional woman invented by Dr. George, George Gay, who first extracted Henrietta Lacks's cells, received undue credit. It was only in 1973 that Lacks's family found out about HeLa cells when scientists called to ask other Lacks family members for genetic samples. Later, a journalist in Rolling Stone publicly outed Henrietta Lacks's true identity in a feature article, which is what you're seeing in the slide there. My creative research tends to fixate on historical incidents where the veneer of civilization begins to crumble. In the case of Henrietta Lacks, I was impl implicated in her narrative before I could comprehend its ethical dilemmas. I was injected with the polio vaccine and I have Henrietta Lacks to quietly think. 
and we can add the COVID vaccine to that as well. After moving to Amsterdam in 2012, I began looking into the history of Jewish diamond polishers and traders from the Netherlands who fled or were persecuted during the Second World War. An entire specialized group of people generating a very specific value around the diamond were made to disappear. I began considering the diamond itself a symbol of forever, foreverness. Despite the four C's used by diamond graders, cut, color, carrot, and clarity, the authenticity of a diamond can only be verified under a microscope. I decided I would create my own microscopic memorial to Henrietta Lacks. Working with scientist, now retired Dr. Claude Backendorf and imaging specialist Herda Lammers at the University of Leiden, we grew HeLa cells on diamonds. The Forever Diamond became a resting place for her immortal cell line. While I initially experienced Henrietta Lacks' narrative, as problematic and a violation of medical ethics, I also found some aspects poetic. A woman whose very skin color denied her the right to be treated for cancer by other hospitals ended up traveling farther than any human had traveled at that time. Her cellular material was being intimately scrutinized by people with whom, in some geographies, the law wouldn't allow her to sit in with at a restaurant. Her cells aggressively overtook other cell lines so that many researchers were unwittingly studying the effects of her cells, resulting in numerous retracted scientific experiments. On a microscopic level, Henrietta Lacks's immortal cell line expressed agency and articulated a claim for space. Sankofa, a concept from the Akaningana, translates as reach back and get it. Embedded in this concept is, is the possibility of shifting one's relationship to a past event, memory, or person. I wanted to reevaluate Henrietta Lacks, the woman, and humanize her image. I developed Portrait of a Woman 1 and Portrait of a Woman 2 with consideration of the woman and the female form as both subject and muse. In artist Willem de Kooning's oeuvre, one can track the trajectory of the female form through his male gaze. Realistic renderings, gradually clumpier female forms, and at the end of his life, we watch the female subject fade into oblivion. His works are titled Woman, and in them the female body lingers between image, muse, and in my opinion, an increasingly distant subject as he ventures further into abstraction. In my own version of the portrait of a woman one, consider Henrietta Lacks in the portrait. While her immortal cell line is still used in biological research today, and her cells are included in over 11,000 patents in the US alone, many scientists familiar with her cells may not recognize her face yet her cells hold her DNA, itself a detailed rendering of a person's genetic structure. In this series, I juxtapose one generic image of Henrietta Lacks called from an internet search that's been digitally modified and another image of Henrietta Lacks' immortal cells growing on diamonds. I substitute the male gaze with the technological gaze. I wonder if one is simply a coded extension of the other. The portrait of Henrietta Lacks' cells remains a portrait at a microscopic level. The portrait of Henrietta Lacks' face remains a portrait in the standard form. Both are ghosts from an interior life and subjectivity that can only be imagined. With Portrait of a Woman 1 and Portrait of a Woman 2, I nominate Henrietta Lacks as the most Mona Lisa of our time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Crystal. Wow. Okay, we have uh, one question. And uh, let me see. Uh,
Okay. It, uh, so the question is uh, from Rehab, and her question is, was Brilliant taking the decision using healing materials such as St. John's Worth? I personally found a very emotional moment seeing the boiling sugar syrup spill, poetic but alarming at the same time. I have a question of how performers, hands and bodies, were prepared to engage and your deep scientific research. And I guess this is for Oliver and Kirsten. Yeah, thank yeah. you, um, Kirsten. Uh, yeah, I, I think we were mostly, we had this kind of three days of shooting this video and it was mostly improvised. So um, we came together so as a group and it was this group of, friends so we were all in this kind of we we're all kind of also changing jobs some people were filming some were performing and it it was quite um yeah this kind of bubble that that was there and um, so this kind of uh undefinition of of or you can't really separate the the certain uh, subjects or bodies you, you know you cannot always know which arm belongs to who or they never become visible as as full um, full bodies so um, I think that was more the approach to to understand this kind of um, change in in subjectivity that maybe is connected to this um, bodily experiences of uh, in true, like this kind of change of how the immune system is um, understood in this kind of research that goes into um, illnesses like HIV. Um, yeah, and it was mostly improvised. <laughs> and we and we did collect a number of actions that uh, we uh, from the interviews that we took, and uh, the image that we showed earlier was really the only. A group of photos that we found of somebody using this as a kind of documentary material. So we also, um, yeah, just collected the words, right? Like putting on your skin, painting on your skin, like different, uh, different descriptions of that process, and then uh, shared that list with the other uh, performers. And that's how we developed this choreography. I guess I have a question. One of the thing that um, actually there's a question from Liz Rowland, which I'm sure is better than my question. The question, the color is very symbolic and powerful in this video. Learning about the film developing process you took, I'm wondering what the post-production editing looked like for you both. At one point, it looks as if the treated skin and background are both animated. I love this piece. So I guess Oliver and Christine. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, of course, color was uh, really uh, like the central element, right? Like we said earlier, because so uh, so when we learned about DNCB, we also spoke to chemists who were at uh, Kodak at the time and who knew uh, what we wanted to find out what DNCB was actually used for in the photochemical process. And we found out that it was used for yellow. Um, and so um, uh, this idea, you know, that the, that the chemistry is also related to color and that there's this color substance that also has a healing uh, um, power, which is, you know, not unusual. A lot of dye stuff is medicine was came out of uh, thinking about dyes and, and color, uh, the research, the chemical research. Um, so this whole complex fascinated us a lot and we wanted to make color kind of a central element. And uh, these effects that you noticed that are, uh, most of them are actually in camera. So we always had layers of vinyl between the camera and the action, and then uh, light is reflecting on that. And you see these kind of washes that, uh, that go over the image. Those were actually made during the performance at the same moment. Um, so that's how that, uh, that happened. And of course, it's also the, the one of the attempts was to kind of blur this kind of boundaries of or this kind of boundaries between the skin and the surface of the film or the video um, to not have these kind of clear, clear borders. This is where the body ends. This is where the 
this other body begins. And I think these kind of layers on top of the image, um, they also support this kind of structure of the piece. Thank you. I guess my question is um, sort of taking us to the exhibition as such. And one of the, th the other thing that sort of connects your work is, uh, is, is the way in which you're sort of mobilizing the viewer. And what I mean by that is Crystal, um, with uh, your two portraits, um, you know, the pieces are fairly low. And so for, for us to really see the work, it requires that, um, that the visitor be willing to kneel or, or bend in some way. Um, so if you could maybe speak a little bit about that decision. Yeah, thank you for the question, Sylvie. Um, yeah, I think part of the work and, you know, in my practice in general, you know, I want to think about how that work lives with the viewer. And um, I think a lot about the body as um, an archival form, right, and sort of memory and, and muscle memory and, and these kinds of things um, tapping into our experience. And I want that to be a very conscious decision on behalf of the viewer to make the effort to to look and to see um, as one would do when they're looking through a microscope as well. And Oliver and, and Kirsten, what strikes me in, in your piece is the ways in which um, we have to make decisions, um, you know, to choose if we, uh, you know, sort of engage with one component more than the other and then to find a kind of sweet spot where we can have a relationship with all three images. And I couldn't help but think about the way in which information is also traveling in our current pandemic, which is very much about this navigating between multiple channels and trying, trying to find um, somehow something that makes sense for how we feel and how we think. So tell, Tell us a little bit about your choice in the kind of uh, layout of the installation. Yeah, I guess in what you were just describing, it gives the, the, the viewer or listener or audience uh, probably a more um, freedom of choice. No, they can, they can move around or they can go closer to the one place or go further away to the others. Mm. And then I think what you could, could maybe see today is that they, it's very different, um, very different materials. So we didn't want to bring them too close together, so that they can also that their relationship is not fixed, basically. So they have different lengths, and you never see the same combination of images and words. Um, and I think that um, that's. Yeah, it, it is actually to have them also have each of them have a bit their subjectivity or their space around them that they can um, have some, yeah, so that they're not overlaying each other or not uh, inter, inter intriguing each other too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this this whole idea, uh, also this idea of how has the uh, current moment changed our view on these issues, right, is so uh, important to mention. Like the, uh, I feel uh, the throughout our process, throughout our research process, all this has happened, and it has also, of course, changed so much our uh, position towards these kind of ideas. So uh, I remember one of the people that we interviewed, she voices this uh, that the um, HIV activists at the time, they developed this uh, very healthy distrust of the medical system and were, uh, were questioning what the what the uh, 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 what the doctor like this medical industry and this is maybe something that relates directly to Crystal's work and uh, and this this distrust has kind of flipped on us in the meantime, right? Like now there is the, uh, uh, right now in Ottawa, this big right-wing demonstration that is all based on this mistrust. And of course, uh, there, there are very different reasons and there are very different 
histories that got people to this distrust, but it definitely complicates and and twists things in a very strange way that we have to, uh, yeah, kind of continue dealing with. Um, maybe that's similar to Crystal. So I don't know if anyone has any other questions for us. We'll be wrapping up uh, shortly. If not, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, okay, we have one, yay. <laughs> uh, so Eric Tyza, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your last name. Uh, going further, how does your work relate to the strange COVID remedies? Our work or any? Or, um... I think ours doesn't. <laughs> but like I said, yeah, it uh, this uh, definitely the way things have changed has uh, also changed a little bit our way to think about it. And uh, uh, we still feel that this idea of alternative treatment and alternative medicine can have a positive effect, but maybe more in the sense that it brought together a community and it created uh, you know, uh, uh, a kind of this idea that you have to school yourself, you have to learn you about uh, what's going on and to have to understand the processes of the pharmaceutical uh, industry and the and the and medicine and so on. So these all these uh, kind of more community building aspects of uh, these treatments were, I think, something to hold on to or to that that kind of went through this unfazed. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, of course, the vaccines, uh, some of the research have been developed, as I mentioned, on uh, with some Hen Henrietta Lacks cells as well. But um, just speaking to what Oliver's saying, there's, um, I don't know, I'm in some medical groups uh, where people are trying to find cures for different things or they share symptoms. And, um, you know, the thing is that a lot of people reach a certain point of desperation that Oliver and Christian are mentioning and are willing to try things that have been, um, that sound very ridiculous to us, right? But I've, I've learned from those groups not to judge um, as much because those situations, like I have no idea what those symptoms and those um, particular subjective conditions um, create in the mind for the person that is experiencing them and um that is a certain type of unknowable desperation right unless you're in the position yourself um but there are all these ways that we're thinking through as artists um in terms of healing and treatment and cure and um the placebo versus the real right and um all of these things um really complicate the line between truth and reality and you know that that's compounded by um the internet and sort of having this siloed of people who are in similar you know in a similar boat asking similar questions so i think that um I don't know, I, I hate to sort of suspend disbelief, <laughs> but there's always that sort of um, these different strategies that may or may not work for other people, but it's hard to convince somebody who who has the fortitude of their own conviction, right? Okay, last chance. Um, and thank you so much, Crystal, Oliver, and Kirsten for joining us today. Uh, the recording will be uh, on Bemis's Vimeo website, website or Vimeo site very shortly. And please do join us next week uh, at 10 a.m. So it's a little bit earlier because one of our speaker is in Abu Dhabi and um, we wanted to make sure it wasn't too late for her. So it is 10 a.m. Central Time. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.